All right, so uh, thanks for coming. We're uh, now starting the panel. The uh, panel is going to run 30 minutes, and then we're going to have the startups, which is probably the reason why you came here. Uh, the other reason... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I came for this panel. Exactly. No, I was about to say that. The other reason is that we assemble the best panel of investors on the planet. Uh, and uh, is that a good enough? Uh, yeah, these two. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're still learning from this one. No. <laughs> so unfortunately, we have only three uh, microphones, so uh, I'll pass I'll it shout. back. Yeah, I think. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. Actually, that good shout. Uh, so the plan uh, is three investors I know fairly well. Uh, I'm sure you uh, have heard about them. They're uh, probably three of the most known investors in the valley. Uh, one thing I could have done is to just introduce them and tell you who they are, give you a, a bio, boring bio. But since I know them uh, personally, I'm going to share some of the stories of my, you know, how I met them. Uh -oh. and, and that's when it gets... Uh... You didn't tell us about this. <laughs> <I don't, yeah. laughs> All right. So I'll start in alphabetical order. So Jeff Clavier, uh, I um, is, is the uh, managing director and uh, founder of SoftTech VC. Um, is famous because is one of the top super angels uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, I actually knew him before uh, he grew his wings, and uh, he did uh, invest in 100 startups, among them Mint, Ustream, 99, 99, 99 startups. 100 will be by small. Uh, 100 tomorrow, uh, had an uh, interesting exit like Mint, Milo, Topolos, uh, Ustream is not, not yet. Not yet. Um, I, I met uh, Jeff when we were working at Reuters together. So we're talking about uh, probably 10 years ago. He was part of Reuters VC. And so I, my job was to work so he could have a salary to spend our money on companies. And, uh, Thank you for you. And he actually did a pretty good job there. But I know him and I knew him before, you know, when he started, then started a consulting firm, started SoftTech VC, started investing his own money, and then got the first success, second success, third success. When people meet me and say, well, do you know Jeff Clavier? And I can say, yes, I knew him even before he became Jeff Clavier. I know when it's, it's actually uh, strange, but people, when, when they are really excited when I mention this. So. Um, mostly male, unfortunately, <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, I've seen him uh, uh, also had the same issue I had, which was getting a green card. So it, I hope we can share some of this. The, the, name, the, the title of the panel is Why and If Silicon Valley Still Matters in the World. And so we want to talk about Italy. We want to talk about why Italy still matters, but why people have moved here. Just to introduce myself in case you didn't... Uh, uh, don't know me, which I assume you do, probably don't. Uh, I'm, my name is Fabrizio Capobianco. I'm the uh, founder and president of Funambul. Uh, Funambul is a Silicon Valley company, raised $30 million in Silicon Valley. Uh, the strange thing about us is that our headquarters is here, but our development center is in Italy, where we have 45 developers, became the largest open source project in mobile, and is in the mobile cloud space. So one of the reason why I'm here is that I uh, actually, I'm Italian, and I, am, uh, I live in Silicon Valley since 99. Uh, Tim Draper uh, is the uh, founder and managing director of DFJ. Uh, DFJ, D is Draper. Uh, he invented viral marketing, uh, which is something that every startup I know is using these days. Uh, had investment in company like Hotmail, uh, Baidu, uh, he invested his own money in Skype because, if I'm not wrong, DFJ didn't want to invest initially, so he put his own money. And then DFJ, uh, as you told me once, paid up uh, to get in the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's part of the history of Silicon Valley because his father and his grandfather were VC and actually are the pioneers uh, in this valley. Uh, if you've never seen a video of uh, Tim, I would recommend you look for the, uh, when he's singing Risk Master, I heard him singing in uh, Budapest once, and it's his most famous song, and if we have a moment, we'll have him sing it. The other one is more for women. He Did is- Did you bring a band? I not. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I heard you- It's gonna be a very loud band, I think, for me to sing. <laughs> 
One of the, the other one you should see and you should Google is the video where he takes off one piece of cloth for every woman CEO he's invested in. And he reminds me of one piece of clothing. So, and I don't know, it's not easy to find uh, on the web, but uh, I had uh, the uh, pleasure to actually uh, watch it. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, so actually, why, why I know... Yeah, prepare. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I said... Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll back. Why do I know uh, Tim? I knew Tim because I went pitching for Funambul and it was my birthday. And uh, uh, he doesn't remember it, but uh, after my pitch, he went away and came back with a um, deck of cards with a DFJ brand, say, okay, this is your gift. And so you go to pitch to a VC thinking you're going to get money, and all I got is a lousy deck of cards. <laughs> but. A week, a birthday present. Nobody else had received a, a birthday present from a VC uh, while pitching. A couple of weeks later, DFJ, as they didn't invest in Skype, didn't invest in Funambul too, and he did exactly the same thing. Called me, actually called Josh, uh, and said, I want to invest on that Italian guy. And so he called me, I showed up at their office, and he said, I want to put a million dollars on, on Funambul. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm leaving for uh, Hawaii tomorrow. I said, okay, get up good car, and I rented a convertible, and thanks for him, and then I came back and someone else offered me five million dollars for four times the evaluation, and I was so stupid that I took it. And so that's the best, the, the, the biggest regret of my life, is that I, I almost got the same money that Skype got, and uh, I didn't take it, so, uh, not, you know, I might not make that mistake again. Uh, last but not least, Scott Sandel, uh, general partner in NEA. Uh, invested in company like Salesforce.com, WebEx. Uh, again, met him uh, because of Funambul. Uh, we had uh, dinner in a French restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, look, I'm not interested in getting an exit quick. I'm here for the long run. This is one of the things you should remember about good investors. They will always tell you that. Because he has been successful before, so he doesn't have to exit quickly. Mm. And uh, we went close, close, close to uh, actually, I still have a term sheet signed by Forrest Basket because you were somewhere else mm. that I cherish as one of the uh, uh, best things that ever happened to Funambul. And the deal didn't happen. He didn't have the, uh, he wasn't lucky enough to uh, put money in Funambul. And uh, we, uh, we met again at the, uh, at the Visionary Award, which I would always recommend for anyone. When we talk about why Silicon Valley matter, you should go to the Visionary Award of the SD Forum in June. Beside the place is great. You have all these visionaries talking. And they have one person presenting and one person introducing. And Forrest Basket, I uh, don't know if you know him, but he's pretty famous. He's a partner of NEA, was there. And I asked him, when are we going to see you present? And his answer was, when I'm going to introduce you. And uh, that will never forget. You mm. probably don't remember, but that's the goal of my life. So uh, to get on that. Thing. And this is another thing you should know about investors that are great, is that they invest in entrepreneurs more than uh, in businesses. So why Silicon Valley? The reason is because they are here. And this is the first thing. Uh, another thing Scott told me during that dinner is, I'm going to China. You know, Silicon Valley is pretty much done. And uh, we all should learn Mandarin. They didn't say that completely, but close enough. Uh, so the, question, the first question I had is, uh, did didn't, you, didn't you say that you wanted to you wanted to learn Italian? <laughs> <laughs> I've always that, was the, that was the first Italian. Then why not? I've always wanted to learn to speak Italian, but the motivations are different. <laughs> <laughs> we were at a French restaurant, by the way, so he picked it. Uh, so, do you speak Mandarin? And uh, if not, why? And why should we invest in China versus why are you here and not in China today? And why are you coming back? Why you're not there? Yeah, so thank you for the nice introduction, Fabrizio. Uh, we, we do invest in China. We invest about 10% of our last three funds in China, and we expect that will grow at some modest rate over time. Uh, we think China is a very exciting place to invest, and, and we've been fortunate to do pretty well there. I think we've had five IPOs uh, coming out of China so far. Um, but we also invest 80% uh, you know, of our money in the United States, and I don't think that's going to change dramatically either for a long time. And the reason is actually not that the three of us are here. The reason is that all of you are here. Mm -hmm. And not just you being Italian necessarily, but some of the best and brightest people from all over the world come here. And as I'm sure you know, 
Silicon Valley is the most uh, diverse metropolitan area in the world today. And I think that is the principal reason for its success. And as long as that's true, I think uh, we'll be investing a lot in Silicon Valley. As to whether I speak Mandarin, uh, no, I don't have any great excuses for that, except that I've met lots of people uh, who have spent the better part of their lives learning to speak Mandarin and still can't conduct a business meeting in Mandarin. So uh, I'm, I'm terrible with languages in general. I think it wouldn't be necessarily the best use of my time. So I had a question for Tim. Um, so I mean, the most important one I have in my mind is have you invested in any company where the CEO is female since that video? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually, before I answer the question, I have to uh, recognize Grazia over here because she wanted to make sure that I mentioned BizWorld, which is a great nonprofit that teaches young kids how business works, and it should be spread all over Italy. <coughs> it'll, it'll help uh, the young Italians understand how to sort of get thinking about being entrepreneurs. So anyway, that's sort of step one. Now the question, what was it? No, no, the question was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the question is, is what makes Silicon Valley unique? Uh, and what? Oh, oh, well, I think it's just um, a really great history of, of a, this, this, this wonderful ecosystem that started with maybe the Intel guys or Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard allowing their employees to spend a little bit of their time moonlighting and going off and thinking about maybe starting companies of their own. And, and that was the beginning. And then you had uh, Terman at Stanford and you had uh, some really creative engineering going on at Stanford. And, uh, and then somehow there were a few more successes and then success bred more success. And I think uh, that once you have sort of about five things, you, you need um, the press to start writing stories regularly about great entrepreneurs. They have to have like a, a flow of entrepreneurial stories. And I think um, we venture capitalists get a little too much credit in the press because we're that regular story for the press. They keep coming back to us because we know that there are these startups. Um, then I think uh, it's also very important to have heroes. So in Italy, if you have one really good technological winner uh, that you can promote and you can say, this look, he's, he's a global, global success, he's a great entrepreneur, have that, or her, have that entrepreneur present to as many crowds of students, of people, and potential entrepreneurs as you possibly can. And then you, you need to work that ecosystem. Uh, it's the bankers, the accountants, the lawyers, it's all the people who sort of help with that, um, with that uh, uh, business environment. And I also think that there has to be um, a little bit of a, in most countries, you. They, don't, they aren't really set up for this. And so you kind of have to create your own way of doing business in, in most countries. Because I go around and I set up venture funds in a lot of different countries. <clears throat> and each time I go, it's, it's slightly different. But the thing that's always the same is the great entrepreneur is that person who has this vision that just they can't get out of their heads and they're going after it and the money doesn't matter, nothing matters. And it's just a train leaving the station. And if you want to get on board, come on board, because we're going to really make something happen. And that's what you were when you came into our office. <laughs> um, think, and yes. women, yeah, we continue to fund women entrepreneurs. We, um, But I think, actually, I had the crown for funding the most women entrepreneurs. And I actually think NEA now owns it. I think, he, I think NEA, I think it had to do with Scott. He got very active with women. No videos. So Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff is French. So the question I wanted to ask him is: Out of the ninety-nine now one hundred investment you have, how many are in France? Uh, so historically, one. Like and there was uh, because my uh, um, 
My friend Pierre Chapaz was starting a new venture. He was the CEO of Kelku in the first bubble. Uh, they sold to Yahoo for uh, $450 million. And he started this new thing called Wikio back in 2005. And I said, you know, I don't do anything in, in France or in Europe, but since it's you, the entrepreneur, let me just, you know, be part of your angel round. And it's now one of the largest new media companies in Europe. So is there a reason why you're investing in the Valley rather than, I mean, being European, you would think you would just pick uh, European startups, like 50% at least? Well, I used to be European. I guess I used to be French or European, but certainly the mindset is um, I've, I've had the opportunity to move here in 2000, uh, became a VC, you know, to move here as opposed to wanting to be a VC and therefore moving here, and um, discovered the world of VC as as the, the world was essentially exploding here. It was, uh, I moved in August 2000. So in August 2000, it was pretty bleak uh, in terms of the world of startups. And I learned essentially the, um, the effect of too much money being uh, put in those companies which didn't really have any product and any sense of what the, their um, customers or consumers uh, really needed. And so when this new generation of uh, capital efficient uh, consumer internet companies started emerging in 2004, I thought, this is interesting, and this is what I'm going to go do, and this is when I left Reuters to, um, to start investing in those companies. And it just happened here. And when you are part of this ecosystem, and I, I had to sort of hustle my way into the deal flow and, and the community because I didn't know anyone being sort of a more traditional VC investing in enterprise software. And one deal after another, one connection after another, managed to, um, to get closer to the you know, the list of people would get the call when an uh, interesting opportunity was being funded. And when you're here, you see so much happening that there's no reason why I would even go as far as, you know, somewhere else in the U.S. One deal actually got me to invest in New York, so now I, I'm actually, actually actively looking at um, opportunities in New York, and we do 80% uh, here, 15% ish in New York, and we don't, we don't really need to invest in, uh, outside of the U.S. and look in Europe. Um, so it's just a question of deal flow opportunities and the fact that when you invest at the early stage like we do, the work we do in terms of support is very local. We meet entrepreneurs day in, day out, we spend a lot of time with them, and anything we do, we can't do remotely. She, she probably disagrees. I don't invest in what can I say? <laughs> she wanted you to invest more in a I European know, startup. <laughs> it's too much early stage. <laughs> so, um, there is, so there is a study that says that between 1995 uh, and 2005, 52% of Silicon Valley company were started or had a founder which was an immigrant. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that I find why people maybe here don't invest in Europe is because the Europeans, the best ones, come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no need to just move from the valley when everything, you know, the best of the best are coming here. One issue that I have right now, and, you know, I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen now, so I don't have that problem anymore, is we're letting people go. And so, and, and that's, in my opinion, stupid. I mean, there, there are a lot of, in, I would say out of these 12 people that will present, 11 will go back and will not have a way to get a visa to come mm -hmm. back here. Uh, and I had, actually, I started two companies in Italy, came here, and I wanted to start a company. I went to Cooley, and they said, dude, find a job. Get an H-1 visa. Get a green card. And that's why I worked for Reuters, which was the only employer I ever had. Uh, and, you know, I spent three years, and it was 99, so probably I got lucky that I you know, went through the, uh, uh, the hole. But it seems like it's getting worse rather than better right now uh, to get a visa. And so I don't know if you have any, Scott, if you have any comment on that, of why, you know, all Chinese entrepreneurs, Indian, they're all going back and starting companies there. Yeah, I think it started getting worse in 2001, and there was a little bit more xenophobia in the administration at that time, you know, uh, set up a much more rigorous immigration department, which is, as far as I can tell, slowed down to a near screeching halt. Um, and, and then that, that seems to be the turning point at which people from other places decided it wasn't worth it anymore and saw great opportunities at home, and we saw that especially in China and India. Um, and as I said a minute ago, Silicon Valley will be a great place to invest as long as you know, a substantial number of the best and the brightest come here. If the government prevents that from happening, you know, we're in trouble. Well, yeah, and I'd like to add to that that a um, school like Stanford gets the best and the brightest from all over the world, and they're going to be fantastic wherever they end up, these people. And 
Um, and then what happens is the U.S. says, "Okay, yeah, you can come. We got the best schools in the world. Come to our come to our country. Come." And then now that now that we've trained you and you're ready to go and really make a big, wonderful living, get out. We don't want you. And that is just ridiculous. Actually, Dad writes about that in his book, The Startup Game, which will go to whoever asked the first question from the audience. Um, it was a wonderful, fun book. But, um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. I, as I go around the world, I, I see that governments, I, I meet with the, I get to meet the president of Ukraine and the president of South Korea and the uh, president of Viet, or the, the deputy prime minister of Vietnam and Singapore, and all of them are saying, come to our country. No, no, it isn't hard to start a company here. We're going to change all that. You know, oh, you need a new, you need a better stock market. We'll create a better stock market. Oh, you want, they are, they're trying to attract the great minds and the capital of the world. They're trying, they're trying to recruit you people and all the capital and the great businesses of the world. They're realizing that since geographic borders are falling, that they have to go into sell mode and it's time to recruit people to their country. So every country of the world is recognizing this. All of the rising stars are recognizing this. And the only ones who don't seem to get it are Europe and the United States. Actually, it's not exactly true. If you look at the program that the UK government has just passed, uh, so they have this comprehensive Startup UK program, which is sort of Startup America, but implemented for real. And we've been working on this thing called <laughs> yeah, Startup Visa, which was meant to actually allow entrepreneurs from you know, foreign countries to move to the US, have visas, provided that they could uh, get some investments from, from people like uh, myself and the other angels, and then stay and build companies. And unfortunately, uh, and it was supported by both sides. You know, Luger and Kerry were both sort of in favor of this. Unfortunately, uh, Barack Obama has decided to put this as part of a comprehensive immigration reform, which means that we're fucked and we'll never, go see, you know, we'll never see the light of this thing. And the UK has, has taken this concept and implemented it, and it's now passed as law. So, so maybe it's not the Europe UK and the US. the US. It's the US. <laughs> we That's got one country, and, and they all wanted to emulate us, and they've all figured out how to emulate us and to create free markets, free trade, small governments, whatever. Um, governments where the private sector is paid better than the public sector, and somehow we've gone the other way. Mm -hmm. Somehow our public sector is now being paid better and look shorter work hours and better vacation. And Looks longer. like France. <laughs> yeah, and, and big pensions and everything. And the people who actually pay for them, the private sector, somehow are being paid less now. It's indentured servitude. So here we are in this country that has the reputation of the greatest, the freest, the best market, the free trade, the free speech, all of that. And, uh, and, and slowly but surely, it seems to be creeping away from us while all these other countries are going, oh, you got free trade? Oh, we'll do that. Oh, you got free speech? Oh, we'll try that. Yeah, anything to attract you guys, attract yeah. the bright, best and the brightest. I, I looked up Startup Chile, which is actually an implementation real. Uh, I know people that actually, they, you go there, they give you $40,000, free office, free visa and everything, and you just go there and start companies. And uh, this is actually, uh, you know, to me, one of the risks, or the biggest risk of Silicon Valley. At a certain point, Silicon Valley might not matter, even if we have the money, because uh, if you only can invest in the Stanford grads that are you Americans, uh, your pool is too uh, limited. So, uh, but I think you know I, I'm, I'm more hopeful that this will change. And good entrepreneurs are good at finding ways to come here anyway. And I've known many. And so, in a certain way, probably it's uh, Darwinian. Uh, only the best will survive. Only the best will get a green card, and you know eventually we'll start companies that will go. <laughs> well, we're lucky because if they come to Stanford. And then, if, if they're great entrepreneurs, no matter where they go, we'll still fund them. Right? <laughs> so that, that in Silicon Valley might not matter anymore. So uh, there is one thing that, uh, since there is the VCs, there are angels, uh, or one angel on, on the panel, is, is how do you see the market between the VC and angel evolve? More looking at 
other countries. One, the reason why I'm saying this is that Italy, for example, we saw before, uh, has $200 million of VC money invested in one year uh, versus $11 billion. So one thing that I see possible for Italy is to do the seed round and then get company off the ground and then move them here. And then you guys that have billions to invest, you can just make, it, make that happen. Uh, does it make any sense to you? Is it, you know, because the other part of Italy is that we have so much money. Uh, it's just there's money everywhere. It's only people keep it under the mattress. They just don't invest on startups or young entrepreneurs. Uh, but uh, there's not big money. There is a lot of small money. And so I don't know if you see this market and how this plays out in Silicon Valley. You know, I, I first of all think the angels are extremely important here in Silicon Valley and, and may play the same kind of role in Italy. The reason is that when I joined the venture capital business in 1996, the industry raised $10 billion in the U.S. And as you just pointed out, Fabrizio, it raised $11.6 billion last year. But in, in the interim, it raised $100 billion at one point and $50 billion a year for quite a while. And so it was a huge amount of money, and, and that is contracting very, very rapidly. Uh, and it's not contracting down to the same number of firms that existed in 1996. It's actually contracting down to a much smaller number of firms than existed. And, the, and each of these firms has a small number of people. And so uh, we need to have a larger number of people helping entrepreneurs. And to the extent that there are uh, people that are now called angels who put up their own money or a small amount of institutional capital and can help many, many more entrepreneurs get started at the earliest stage, then the venture capital industry could ever you know, help. I think it's a hugely beneficial thing. And, and I would hope that that same thing will happen in Italy. I've lost one you know, there's, there's one other thing, and that is if you, um, if you start a business in Italy, there is a great advantage because uh, it's a more forgiving customer. In Italy, you would naturally support your Italian entrepreneur. And, uh, and that happens in, mo in most countries and most states in the U.S. Uh, if we start something in, uh, in Utah, the Utahns all are very loyal to the Utah company. And so they're a more forgiving customer. And when you're a startup, you need a more forgiving customer base at the beginning. And, and then maybe you proved it out in Italy, and you just do a translation to English, and then you start moving outside. Yeah, so one of the suggestions I always give to startups is get traction. I mean, you come from nowhere. And do due respect to Italy. In order to do it in Silicon Valley, the only thing you can show is traction. If you show up with a good idea, nobody's going to give you money. But if you show up with, you know, I have a quarter of the country, 20 million people uh, using my, my platform, I'm sure, you know, you can raise money to make it global. Yeah, there are good examples. I mean, um, I'm thinking of this company called Unity, which is developing a unique technology for 3D games. So it's the 3D rendering engine. And those are basically a bunch of Danes who started over there in Denmark and just developed a ton of interest and traction in the gaming industry. And Sequoia actually went there and grabbed them and moved them here to fund them. And now they are doing extremely, extremely well. So it wasn't a, a, qu a question of did they try to sort of move to Silicon Valley. They just were handpicked because they were doing something unique, which developed a ton of visibility. And that's the way for European entrepreneurs to um, to essentially do it, it's build something which is big, ambitious, the way people do it here, and if you're successful, you know, the rest will just happen. As opposed to trying to figure out how you can grow in your market and then go to, you know, the next country and then maybe one day think about moving to London and then, you know, when you're 15 years old, you know, attack the US, mm -hmm. which, is, which is very often the, Euro the European ambition. I agree. So I had one last question, then uh, I'll take two questions from the... Uh uh, from the uh, crowd. Uh, are we in a bubble? Yes, no? I don't think it's a yes, no. Bubble issues? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, things are bubbling up. Okay. Uh, so it's starting to bubble up. It's, um, and it's starting at the seed level. It's starting with the... Uh, oh, it's not my fault. With, <laughs> oh, you yeah. try with it. And, they, um, and the, the prices are moving up for these early stage companies, which is kind of remarkable because you've got all these early stage companies and the prices are going up for them, but all the early stage companies have taken 15 years or whatever to get public uh, because it's so hard to take a company public now. Uh, but I think they're seeing 
that there's going to be a swing there. They don't. They aren't thinking that these companies are all going to be bought by bigger companies. I think they're thinking these are big companies. They're companies that are going to stick around and employ people and uh, grow well. And and I think they're they're hoping that things like uh, expert financial, the XPO, will allow these companies to go XPO, private IPO, before they go public. Uh, and it'll it'll create more liquidity. Otherwise, those angels they they must have very long time horizons, fifteen year time horizons. So they make their initial bet and then they just twiddle their thumbs for fifteen years. Both of you were trying to help or work, um, and <coughs> then hopefully at the end of fifteen years something will happen. Well, there has to be some liquidity along the way, and I think uh, expert financial might have the solution. I think it's sector dependent. I think clearly early stage consumer internet feels bubblish to me. Um, and some later stage internet companies seem bubblish. But clean tech is not having any bubblish characteristics at the moment. Biotech, not very bubblish. Uh, so, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily the end of the cycle either, which is I think what you were su suggesting, Tim. I mean, this, this could be the beginning of something that builds from here. And contrary to the last big bubble we had, I think there's some really exciting companies that have been developing mm -hmm. for a while, which actually have reason to get the valuations that they're getting. So, and that, that's based on, you know, ultimately a very, very rich ecosystem of innovation, which is alive and well. The, the issue, I think, is that it's well known that for a long time, every 10 years, there's an interesting company uh, sort of being built up, uh, Yahoo and, and Google, and then <clears throat> in... Um, in in the last three, four years, we've seen Facebook, uh, we've seen uh, Twitter, we've seen Groupon, we've seen Zynga, which are four extremely powerful companies which have either massive audience, massive revenue, or both, and have invented you know, new models, whether it's social, whether it's you know, how to leverage local, and so on and so forth. And people are extremely enthusiastic about the fact that this could be sort of vectors of just a brand new ecosystem. And the problem is that they're investing in those very stage companies as if they were the next group on next Facebook. And most of them aren't. And if you give them that valuation, well, good for them, but for you as an investor. So I mean, overall, it looks like a bubble, which is different. At least there are companies that make a billion dollars, or two, or three, or four. So I think that on the, others, you know, mm -hmm. the upper end, I don't remember 99, a lot of companies making billions when they were going public. So, mm. um, and uh, so our goal is to transition that all the Italian companies in the valley, and then make them, uh, you know, get angels maybe later stage, and just you know make someone really really big. Uh, we're late because we're Italian, so actually I'm Italian, so that's okay. Well, that uh, was yours, your intro was the longest. Yeah, intro ever. Exactly, in the history of mankind. Um, but it was interesting, uh, and uh, so we have. <laughs> so I'll take uh, two questions. One. He won the book. He wants the book. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> no, well, no, I have a question. Um, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a mic on. Yeah. No, it's uh, it just turned but on. Do you see any, any progress in, in investment towards technologies that focus on, uh, let's say, the bottom of the pyramid in the, of the population, like uh, technologies, especially? For developing countries, this kind of things. Is there has there been any progression in the last years? Thanks. I think there has been. I mean, we've seen a number of companies, particularly uh, leveraging mobile platforms, mm -hmm. that in one way, shape, or form uh, are are providing access to that market. Uh, we saw one that was a, essentially an e-commerce company marketing through mobile companies with some sort of pop-up messaging scheme and some sort of credit system. It was a very exciting company. I forget what it was called. Uh, and then we more recently saw one that's using uh, the, uh, the idea of your mobile bill as a payment mechanism. So I think, uh, you know, there's a variety of interesting things starting to happen there. We have a, um, we have a business plan competition that we do every year with Cisco. It's a global business plan competition where, by the way, you're both invited. Um, uh, where we look at the video conference and people do these business plans all over the world world and so in in one day we see one from each time zone um, and one of the winners was d light which is these solar lights that you that you can use in any place and and they're just changing people's lives incredible changes to people's lives 
Then the other thing I can think of is um, read that book, because my dad writes about Kiva, which uh, started out as a for-profit company. And then they realized that the rules for a for-profit company were just going to crush them. And so they made it a nonprofit. And as a nonprofit, they've been able to do these uh, leverage or these these uh, loans, small uh, micro loans to all people all over the world, and uh, and the lenders just keep re-upping. They, you know, the loan gets paid back, and they go, oh, well, I'll just loan it out again. And so those loans are really spreading very far. And uh, so I think, at, and and that company has gone from. I mean, that budget is now, they call it a budget now, it's a $100 million budget in about five years. And that would have been a huge, huge success going after that um, group, a, a huge commercial success going after that group. But it had to be non-profit. So take another question. <coughs> There's no book, so we only have <laughs> yeah, I better first question, which would have been uh, where do the other people get the books since I asked the first question, but I didn't ask Amazon. It, so. <laughs> Amazon. Um, the startup game, William Draper. Okay. okay. Uh, as far as uh, tying in our energy situation, um, solar and wind, um, and into Silicon Valley, and perhaps even Italy, since Italy is, uh, and, and a lot of Europe is much more uh, in, advanced in solar and, uh, and, and being efficient. Uh, where do you guys see investment? Uh, do you see investments in that area in this, uh, in this realm here? Well, we, uh, we have an energy technology practice. We've invested about a half a billion dollars in 37 companies, uh, some of which are based outside the U.S., but primarily they're based here, and they range from solar companies, of which we probably have seven to ten now doing various different things and efficiency as, uh, companies. We have a new electric motor company, a new combustion engine company that makes an engine that's 40 percent more efficient than anything Detroit has invented. It was invented in a garage here, so on. Yeah, we have a wide variety of different um, clean tech <coughs> companies, too. Um, one solar thermal where they take all the mirrors and they point them all into one place and, and boil water. and. The water turns to steam and drives a piston and uh, creates electricity. And it, it turns out that's that's very popular. Um, I actually think that we can't invest in it. We, I mean, I've I, I've tried, but I think nuclear power. I mean, it's a great time to say it. Watching the plant blow up in in uh, Japan, but uh, but nuclear power is. The solution. I mean, it's, it's clean. It's it's it is the solution. We're we have wonderful clean tech portfolio. They're all going to be great solutions. There's wind. There's solar. There's geothermal. There's all sorts of things. There are a lot of energy saving companies in the portfolio, and they're all wonderful. Um, but the big problem we have, and maybe Italy doesn't have this problem, is that if you want to start building a nuclear power plant, small nuclear power plant, um, it, it will, if you start today, it will be five years in, um, in seeing if they will allow you to draw up plans, five years in drawing up the plans and getting them approved, and then five years in drawing up the plans for actually building the plant. And then, so you start year 15, so you're putting millions and millions of dollars in before and, and just supporting the, the great bureaucracy of the United States, uh, where, where if, if, you, if you could get Italy to just go ahead, start today. Um, <laughs> now we have actually... Don't you have <laughs> now there is actually a vote coming down in June against nuclear and, you know, the worst timing possible in the history of mankind to have that, yeah. and so it's going to go down to a no, and so I think nuclear will be dead in Italy. Yeah. Angel, so. Well, see if you Wrong turn country. that around. <laughs> because it is, it's the, it's the cheapest, cleanest, it's, it's, it's the best power we got. Yeah, they don't allow us uh, to vote. People from the, that actually. Well, you're American now, so. Oh, you oh, I actually have two passports. You can influence. Okay, yeah, or show up. Yeah. They actually pay me for a second uh, class train ticket. Yeah. Not kidding. Uh, so, well, uh, just join me with a uh, big round of applause for our panel.
think we uh, we concluded that uh, Silicon Valley still matters, and then we uh, think that we can screw it up if we don't allow Italian to come here, uh, or you know people from the outside. And now we're gonna see the entrepreneurs that will make Italy a uh, success. We need one of these 12 guys to become a big success in Italy and then explain to the rest of the country how it's done. Uh, I have the list of startups, but I think uh, Marco will uh, read it. Oh, well, let, let, let's give these guys another round of applause. Good job, Fabrizio. Uh, Fabrizio, you, you dig out a, a good chunk of... Uh, dirt that uh, even half of that was was real uh, that was still a scoop so good job for the panel um, and Tim guess what we also have a business plan competition and by the way you'll invite it for the next round uh, and now it's time to work so the idea is and you know the